I want to uh, talk to you a little bit about a subject that most of you in here probably think that you really know and understand. Everybody here probably is an expert on what love really is. If you don't know what it is, just ask any teenager. They, they know what love is. But there's a lot of difference between love and, and lust. The strong desires that people may have. There's different kinds of love. Uh, God explains it in His Word what it is. And so it's always best to get a definition from, Lord, what do you mean by that? So if you will, take your Bible and turn to the book of Mark. The book of Mark, Gospel of Mark. Got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And there's a, a, a scripture here that kind of gives us an idea. Now, there's several things that I want to talk to you about, and that is, there's eight things that love is greater than, and eight things that love does, and there's eight, th eight things that love doesn't do. So you need to know these 24 things. Eight things that love is greater than. Eight, eight things that love does and eight things that love or won't do. Because we are told to love the Lord, and to love our wives, love our husbands, our, love our children, love one another, the God's love of the world. But there's a set of rules that comes along with love. Christ made the statement that the world may know that I love my Father, even so I do. So he did what he did in order to prove to the world that he loved his father. So there was eight things that he did and eight things that he didn't do. But here in the book of Mark in chapter 12, look in verse 28. And one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had gathered them well or answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy mind, or soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. The second is like, namely this, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. So these are two of the great commandments in the Word of God. And everything deals about this. Even when God gave the Ten Commandments, the first four was about them and God, and the last six was about them and man. So it deals with your relationship to God and to man. Now I know that it's easy to read a verse like John 3, 16, God so loved the world. And it's easy for God to love the world, right? We're so lovable. Well, the next time you don't think that God loves you, or you don't think that God can use you, I want you to think again. Because love does things that I guess sometimes the normal person wouldn't think of to do, or how you think, or how you feel. But remember, God used Noah. Everybody knows that good. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And God used him to build a big old ark, and... Save the world at his time. But the Bible also says that Noah got drunk. So I guess God, he can use a drunk. He still loved the drunk. Anybody ever heard of a man named Abraham in the Bible? Well, you know God couldn't use him. He was too old. He was just an old man. I mean, God's got to use some young people, right? He can't use these old folks. You remember a man named Caleb? He was 80 years of age. When they crossed the river, he says, I want that mountain. I want that mountain. And there's a little chorus that goes along with that little song. I want that mountain. I want that mountain. Where the milk and honey flow. Where the grapes of Esco grow. I want that mountain. I want that mountain. The mountain that my Lord has given me. 80 years old. How old was Moses when God used Moses? Yet God did use Moses. But remember, Moses was a man that, well, he couldn't talk very good. He had an impediment of speech. And he said, use my, use my brother Aaron. But God wanted to use him. 
You see, whenever we look at ourselves, we may not see too much about what can do with us. God can do with it. But God can. You see, love changes things. Love gives people a second chance. Love even gives people a chance. God is looking for somebody that He can show Himself strong on their behalf. Remember old Isaac, daydreamer? Jacob, he was a liar. Can God use liars? He says, every man is a liar. Let God be true and every man a liar. Look at the kind of people that God's had to use down through the centuries. And sometimes you sit and you think, well, I, I'm just not worthy to be used by God. I'm not much at all. Did you know that God can take a, a, a crooked stick and hit a straight lick with it? And God can use you. Because of love, love overrides so much. Love covers a multitude of sins. Love is what causes us to forgive one another, be patient with one another, to be kind to one another. Leah, they didn't think was as pretty as Rachel. It says Rachel was pretty. Maybe Leah was ugly. I don't know. I never saw her. But there's something about the other one that he wanted. And yet he was deceived. And he worked seven years to get Rachel and he wound up with Leah. Then he had to work another seven years to get the other one. Well, a lot of crooked people back in those days. Aren't you glad that that's not like it today? We don't have stuff like that going on. Where you, you, you know, somebody wrongs you or defrauds you. Oh, what happened to him? Joseph, well, he was abused. I mean, his brothers didn't like him. Didn't care about him. They even wanted to put him to death. But they sold him instead and he goes out, goes down into Egypt. They could probably use a good man like Joseph right now. You remember it wasn't a few weeks back that I told you, says, now, I don't know when and I don't know how. But sooner or later, God is going to take and cause something to happen in this, in this world with the Arab nations. Now you probably say, you, you didn't say that. Yes, I did say that. I said it before this happened. And I said it's very close and something's going to definitely take place. You see, the Bible has to be fulfilled because the Bible is true. All nations will have to turn against Israel. Something will have to happen by which Israel will have the right to exist as a nation, to exist as a people, to have their land. To build their temple. And someone has told me this morning that it was in the Jerusalem Post just this week. That they're buying a lot of marble in order to build their temple. I think it's exciting. Just to get up in the morning and wonder, well what's going to happen next? But reading the Bible is more up to date than tomorrow's newspaper. Well, Gideon. Remember Gideon? He was afraid. When it says that angel came up behind him and says, Thou mighty man of Gideon, Gideon, he turned around ten times looking for him. He said, you mean, you mean me? He says, I'm the least in my father's house. You can't use me. But God could use him. Because see, that's what love does. Love sees people and potential in people. I used to have teenagers come to ranch. I used to think that God could only use the key kids. And a lot of times those key kids was always caught up in themselves. They thought only about themselves and their little happiness and what they wanted to do. And sometimes I overlooked some little quiet kid sitting there. The kid that didn't have all of his, maybe his marbles. Well, he maybe had his marble, but a shooter was missing. And there's just something not, not there. And I've learned over the years to look at people a little bit different too. That, you know, when God looks at you, he sees a pearl. He sees a jewel. He sees a diamond. We see a, a hunk of coal. There's people that we don't like. There's people we don't want to be around. There's people that don't measure up to our standards. But there's a God in heaven that looks deeper into the heart of each individual. And to try the hearts. To see who he can use and how he can use them. God is a magnificent God. He's a God that works, but he works in the lives of people that you wouldn't think that God could ever user they couldn't be of any profit whatsoever remember somebody named Samson had long hair went to a ladies barber shop it wasn't his hair he wished not that the spirit of the Lord had withdrew from him you see God still used him 
But He could have used them in greater ways. You see, sometimes we limit what God can do with us because of our lack of love for Him. We are supposed to believe above everything else. God loves me. God loves me. My dad may not have loved me. My mom may not have loved me. My brother and sister may not. It doesn't matter. God loves me. God loves you. It doesn't matter about anybody. God loves you. And the one that created the heavens and the earth and really knows you. Knows what you've done and what haven't done. And God still loves you. That's something to be thankful for. God is love. When you know what love is, then you have to study about God. But you'll learn more about God by seeing what did he do with people. Because that's what I am. I'm a person. When God looked at the world and he saw all these people and yet he wanted to get a will done, he, he, he used different people from all walks of life. And all the various different uh, status in life. Rahab, she was a prostitute. But God used her. Naomi, she was a widow. But what a beautiful story about Ruth. But God used her. Yeah, a widow woman. She'd been in another country. Her husband died. Her sons died. She came back with nothing. But Ruth says, I'm, I'm going with you. And your God's going to be my God. And your people are going to be my people. What a testimony she must have had. She had something. And it was real. She guided that little girl to tell her what to do and what not to do. And she did it. And on down the line, here comes a guy named David. And on down the line, here comes Jesus Christ. What a God. And you think sometimes God doesn't love me or God can't use me? Oh, yes, He can. He said, we don't listen. We don't listen to what God has to say. You ever heard of a man named David? Man after God's own heart. Boy, he'd never do anything wrong, would he? The sweet psalmist of Israel, sitting on the hillside, plucking on his harp, singing to the, the sheep, sitting there every night and looking at the stars and talking about how that the magnificent heavens and so forth declare the, the wonders of God. Talking about the sun and the moon, all these things, and talk about the word of God, how it's so pure and righteous. And the testimonies of the Lord are sure, making wise the simple. Yeah, oh David. But I, 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 think, I, think, uh, I think he messed up too. I, I think he was a womanizer. I, I actually believe that uh, he probably committed murder. Man came to him one day and says, Thou art the man. Thou art the man. And God had to judge him. Oh yeah, he had a lot of... Wonderful things you can say about David. But there was a lot of sorrow in his heart too. And you read the 51st Psalm and see how it broke his heart. Because he broke God's. And God says, I'm not looking for sacrifice, but of a broken and contrite spirit. You see, God is still looking for people that, no, there ain't nobody here perfect. I'm not, you're not, none of us are perfect. But believe it or not, if God didn't use imperfect people, there wouldn't be anybody to use. If God can't use us, then they, who else can He use? So God is looking for somebody, but He does want you to love Him with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, in spite of that old sinful nature that you've got, and how unworthy we may be, and how lack of talent and ability and wisdom that we have. But God is still God. And His love overrides so much, oversees so much, and gives us chance after chance after chance. He's the one... That can determine the next heartbeat. He's the one that can take away your breath. At any moment. You know whenever I read about Job. And all that he went through. It wasn't when Job lost all of his assets. When Job, he lost his wealth. And all that stuff. He lost his kids. He still maintained his integrity. But he didn't cry out until he, the devil got his body. When God got his body. When you get down physically. You can get down spiritually. And you'd be surprised how many times that God will afflict your body and allow it to be afflicted. Because it's the greatest test of your spirituality. Where are you with God? Does He mean more than you, than life itself? More than the body? More than the wealth that you have? God loves you so much. And He wants you to learn how to love Him back. And you'll learn how to love Him by seeing how did God love? Is it only because there's people who deserve 
to be loved? Because we're supposed to be kind? Or is it real? Or hypocritical? You ever heard of a guy named Isaiah? Believe it or not, there was a time when he preached naked. We won't go into that. <laughs> Jeremiah and Timothy, well, well, they were too young. But God used them. Elijah, he was suicidal. He was suicidal. The guy was always, it seemed like, in a state of depression. Always depressed. Always down, discouraged. In spite of all the great things that God did for him, he could let one woman say something to him, and he'd run for the rest of his life. Hide under a juniper tree and says, I'm the only one left. Poor, poor me. You know why I don't have pity parties anymore? Nobody would come. But he was ready to, he wanted to die. I'm not, I don't want to live. All these things that are mentioned in God's Word. You ever hear of a guy named Jonah? What did Jonah do? Well, he ran from God. I know Christians have been running from God most of their life. Oh, they're saved. They have eternal life. They're going to go to heaven when they die. But they've been running from the Lord. Not to the Lord. Not with the Lord. But from the Lord. I bet you there's people sitting here right now. You have spent years of your life running from God. Because you will not do what God says to do. You can still be on your same job, same home, same church. But been running all your life. Because you never yield to do what God wants you to do with your life. Maybe you're afraid of being a failure. Maybe you're afraid God won't come through. Maybe you think God's going to leave you hanging out there on the limb and you were afraid to get out there. So by cause of fear, you won't do anything for God. You won't step out. You won't live by faith. You know, that's a lack of love. That's a lack of love. Because see, if you really believe God loved you, you would try anything. You'll do anything. You'll tempt anything for the Lord. Nothing could hold you back. Love can do that for a person. There's a lot of power in love. Because I know God loves me. I want to do as much as I can, while I can, as long as I can, in the body that I have, until God calls me home. John the Baptist, what a man, what a man. No man like this man. That's what Jesus said about him. He ate bugs. I mean, who wants to go around with a man who eats bugs? Locusts? Live like a wild man? I mean, God can't use a guy like that. He's looking for the guy in a three-piece suit who's, you know, looked up to him with dignity and respect. I've lived long enough to see that there's people that I would think, God, God can't use that person because that person won't clean up their life. And then I look at a person who's got a clean life that God doesn't use because the heart's not there. Did you know that you can be all nice and clean and sweet and pretty? And you can look all decked out this morning. You can really look sharp. You look in that mirror and you're an epitome of health. But rotten on the inside. Because your heart ain't right. You do it to be seen of men. That can be hypocritical. It's not because you love God. Or you love people. It's sometimes I believe there's people who just want to do enough to keep God off their back. So that God doesn't chasten them. But they live close to the edge. And you never know at what point. What is it going to take to key them off? What little word before they explode? You ever heard of somebody named Martha? Mary and Martha? Martha worried about everything, didn't she? Worry, worry, worry. I mean, God can't use a worry wart. And yet there's a lot of people with nothing more than just a worry wart. Worry all the time. Can't sleep at night. Can't work during the day. They don't love because they can't trust. You see, when you really love, you can trust. Do you trust your husband? Do you trust your wife? Can you trust your kids? Can you trust God? Who do you trust? You know, it's a shame to go through life without anybody to love and no one to trust. To put everything that you have in yourself. Look into yourself, trusting in yourself. What a terrible way to live. When your Bible says, Cursed is the man who putteth his confidence in flesh, or trusting in himself, or to exalt himself. 
Mary Magdalene, well, she was demon-possessed. The Samaritan woman, she'd been married five times. I mean, God can't use her. And yet he used that one little link to reach a whole city of men. I wonder why the men. Never mind. Well, Zacchaeus, anybody heard the story of Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus was a wee-wee man, and a wee-wee man was he. He climbed up in the sycamore tree to see what he could see. And as the Savior passed that way, I don't forgot the rest of it. He looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down. I'm going to your house for tea. tea. Whatever. But a whole story in the Bible because he was a little man. But not just that he was a little man, he was a tax collector. And everybody loves them. Think of how you feel right now about the IRS. Don't you just love them? But God used Zacchaeus. It didn't matter who they were. When Christ was choosing his disciples, did he give everybody? He even chose man that was filled with the devil. Oh, Judas, who never trusted him. But God gave him a chance. See, God loves us. Is that we don't learn how to love. Look at the chances God gives and the forgiveness that he has to have. And the reason he doesn't use perfect people, there aren't any. There aren't any. Neither are you. So just get the chips off your shoulders and stop exalting yourself and stop looking down your long, pharisaical nose and thinking you're like Kellogg's cornflakes, just a little bit better. But you ain't. We're all the same in God's eyes. We're sinners. We've all come short of God's perfection. These disciples, well, they, you can always depend on those disciples. They just fell asleep when he asked them to pray. They just all fell asleep. They couldn't stick with it. Peter, well, what did Peter do? Oh, he just denied the Lord. You've never done that, have you? Peter did. Did God still use Peter? Still used him. Paul, well, you know Paul, he was just too religious. He was taking all those Christians and putting them into prison. So God can't use a man like that. But one day, a lightning bolt struck and hit him, knocked him to his knees, and he says, Lord, what will thou have me to do? God can use him. And God did use him. Use him in a great way. Timothy probably had an altar. And if God can use Lazarus, he can use anybody. You say, why? Well, see, Lazarus, he, he was a dead man. If God can use a dead man, he can use you. Do you know in the Bible it talks about God using a jackass. And the old jackass was talking to Balaam. Whenever Jonah was out there on the hillside overlooking the city, see if God was going to destroy the city or not of Nineveh, and, and, and God used a gourd. It came up and put shade over him, and he was so thankful for that gourd because it shielded him from the sun. And then God made a worm. Put it in the gourd. It killed it. Now Jonah was mad again. He says, you have more concern over that stupid gourd than those people down there. Some people never get their priorities straight. Take your Bible and turn there to the book of 1 Corinthians. The book of 1 Corinthians in chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I want to show you very quickly the eight things that is that love is greater than. See here in verse 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become of sound and brass and tinkling some. Love is better than the ability to speak in any language. Some man wrote a book called Love in Five Languages. I've never read the book, so I have no idea what it's about. But I know that regardless of how many languages there are, love is better than all languages. And it says in verse 2, And though I have the gift of prophecy, understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. So the ability to speak in languages, to speak in the tongues of angels, the gift of prophecy, the knack of solving all mysteries, knowing everything, and then he says there, I can even remove mountains. Love is greater than that. Than the faith to remove a mountain. And I have not love. So love is greater than all of those things. It's greater. 
the resource to feed the world's poor. If you could, in verse 3, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, if you could food, feed not just one person, if you could feed the whole world and not have love. Love is greater than that. See, there's a lot of people who give to a lot of humanitarian things. You can look on the TV and they'll show you some little puppy dog, some little kitty cat, tears in his eyes. And you'll get out your checkbook and you'll start writing out because the compassion is there. Now you can do all of that. And I'm not against you helping anybody. But love is more than that. Did you do that because of the dog or that cat or because it made you feel good? What was the motive? It takes a relief off of you. It shows you. It shows that I'm kind. It shows that I love. And that's why I did that. You check your motive of why you do what you do because God checks the motives. When they show that little kid on the TV screen about only 25 cents a day or only 50 cents a day or only a dollar a day or $20 a month and you can help some poor little child and it, the compassion is there because there is a sense that we care about others. And I think it's wonderful that people do care. Otherwise there would nobody be given to anybody. And we ought to learn to give. But it doesn't go deep enough. There's more to it. It's a temporary satisfaction. Because those animals you just kept alive, they're still going to die. That little girl, she's still going to grow up. And maybe she's going to die. And she will die. The greatest love is trying to meet their greatest need. What is the greatest need? You'll have people talk about, there's kids that are not going to have Christmas. Where does it say in the Bible that everybody has to have Christmas? Every kid has to have a toy. Where does it say that in the Bible? Or what about those people that are hungry? And every Thanksgiving, we've got to have the soup line so that we can give everybody a Thanksgiving Day meal. What about all the other meals for the other 364 days? Do I feel good because I did this one deed at this one time? Or do you look deeper? What is their greatest need? And their greatest need is to know God. It's good that we can do the others. Don't misunderstand me. You put words in my mouth and I'll hate you for that. Don't you do that. I say what I mean. But whenever you understand there's something greater to live for. And that is so that they know the love of God. That God has shed abroad in this whole world through the gospel of Jesus Christ. That people need to know the Lord. Because you see, eventually, all those people that got that meal or those little child, children that got that toy, they're still going to die. They're still going to die. What was their greatest need? We need somebody to really love them. More than the surface. And I think it's good that we can maybe give aid at times to people in other countries. But along with that aid ought to come a Bible or a heaven track or some missionary. To say this is what we're really about. And this is why we do what we do. Because of our love for the Lord. Anyway, those are my humble opinions. And I just like expressing them once in a while. <laughs> Let me show you this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I want you to see the... The eighth thing that love does. Look what love does. In verse 4, charity is the word for love. Love suffereth long. It is kind. Love envieth not. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Love never fails. Now there's eight things here about love that love will do. And because of that, you and I, because God is love. You want a good description of what God is like? You just got it. Those eight things. Tells you a little bit about the heart of God. How that God thinks and how he feels. Well, when you and I trust Christ as our Savior, he said his love is to be shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. So the love that God has is supposed to be the same kind of love we express. That we express. Because, see, I know people who are nice to animals but mean to people. They'll feed some little kid in some foreign country but not do right by the people in their own home. Check your reason or your motive. 
God is not a respecter of person. God loves us all. We are supposed to demonstrate the love of God, how God thinks and how He feels, and how we treat one another. And as He goes down through and He says, you see, love suffers long. It means for a long time. It means you can put up with a lot. It means you're not short-tempered. It means you're not explosive. Because see, love causes you to be patient with people. To love one another. Not to bite your wife's head off every time she says or does something she shouldn't do. Or your husband or your kids. Because love is love. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love rejoices in truth. And we want to know truth. We love truth. We seek truth. Not to believe everything you hear about everybody. Beware of those who gossip. A person who will gossip to you will gossip about you. The only difference between a person who gossips and a buzzard is one eats you when you're alive and one eats you when you're dead. Kind of kills your appetite for lunch, don't it? But you bear all things because you love. And love believes all things, isn't suspicious. Love hopes and endures and never fails. We're to love each other, our wives, our husbands, our families, our church, with an everlasting love. Our love for one another is not to be dependent upon their treatment of us. Let me repeat that. Our love for one another has nothing to do with anybody's treatment of us. How you treat me has nothing to do with me loving you. I should love you because I am love. God loves us because God is love. That's what He is. And the more you want to be like the Lord, the more you learn how to love. And it kind of keeps you from being so judgmental and critical and hard and mean and ugly. There are so many Christians that grow up to be a mean old man or a mean old woman. And always trying to pick apart everything that's done. Always looking for the dirt. Always looking for trash. Instead of little... God uses all kinds of people. And a lot of people will never rise up to our caliber. But we're to love them just as much. And try to see how God might be able to use this person. How can God use this person? There's some positions that a person can't have because they're not ready for it yet. But you want people to rise to the occasion. I want people to know, look, God loves you. But I also want people to know, I do too. I do too. See, I, I love this guy down here. I love that woman. I love that man. I love Peter over here. I love these kids. I want them to know I love them. I doesn't mean I approve everything they do, but I love them. I care. I want the best for them. I want God's will for them. I want God to use them. I want them to be challenged and motivated to do something for the Lord. Because God says, love the Lord with all thine heart, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. Everything that you have. Eight things that love does not do that are listed here is it doesn't envy. It doesn't vaunt itself. It means it, a vain display of what one is or what one has. Not puffed up. Not to exalt yourself. You see, God says if we will humble ourselves... God will exalt us. But pride exalts a man. And God says that he'll have to humble the man. You see, God, Christ came into the world to, to minister, to serve. We think that we are here to be served. I want everybody here to serve me. As the pastor of this church, I don't look like it that I'm here lording over you. Or you're here as my servants. I am your servant. I'm here to serve you, to help you. To do anything I can to lead you. But my being here is not for me. My being here is for you. And I want to lead you as best as I know how in the right direction. I know that I have to have an example of a believer as a pastor to practice what I preach. Because I know that one day when I stand before the Lord, I've got to give an account of everything that I've said and everything that I've done. He says that teachers will receive the greater condemnation. It means there's a greater judgment upon you because you expect more. And you want people to think and to feel that maybe I'm not everything I ought to be, but whatever I am, God, I'm yours. And I want you to use me in whatever way that you want to use me. 
Love does not behave itself in an unseemly manner. Love seeketh not its own. Love is not easily provoked. Love thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in iniquity. Remember this. Love always does what it does not have to do. You see, why in the world would people go to a foreign field, some missionary field, and leave up everything in the world? Because love sends them. Love made them do that. What would cause somebody like the Apostle Paul to spend years in prisons, cold, damp prisons, and go through what he did? Love made him do that. Love made him do that. What makes a mother get out of bed and walk the floor with the kid? She's got a hooping cough and she worries and she prays and she walks the floor all night long. Love is to do that. What makes you endure the things that you go through in your marriage or with your children or your grandkids? Love makes you do that. Love them with all your heart. This is the only chance in this world that your husband or your wife or your kids, your grandkids, will ever see love in action. See, they can't see God. They can see you. And, and, and you tell them you know Him. And you tell them that you, you want to be like Him. They're looking. They're watching. And it's so important. You can take this same scripture and go down through here and wherever it has the word charity, you can put the word God in there. You see in verse 4, God suffereth long is kind. God envieth not. God doesn't vaunt himself. God is not puffed up. God does not seek things that are wrong. God's all the way through. God, God, God. And then when you get through doing that, you can do the same thing with the word Christ. And then on top of that, when you get through, put your name in there. And see how it measures up. Are you a child of love? You are a child of God. But let the love of God manifest himself in you. And let him manifest himself through you. And God will bless you for doing so. As you know, I'm cut just a little bit short. One of the reasons is because I am totally exhausted. And uh, I know you'll, you won't get mad at me for quitting early, will you? You won't, you won't get mad at that now. Now next Sunday when you come back and I go to the top of the hour, you're going to understand that I, I let you off a little bit earlier today. So you remember that. Look up here. This hand represents you and me. The wallet represents sin. That's all those bad things that we do. And everybody born into the world is a sinner. We've all come short of God's perfection. We don't love the way God wants us to. We don't receive love the way God wants us to. Because of old sinful nature, we're marred and scarred from the day we were born. But God in heaven loves us. He loves us. He don't like what we do wrong, but He loves us. Can you in your own mind just say those words, God loves me. God loves me. Oh, He loves the world, but you've got to believe, God loves me. And don't judge that by anything that's happened in your life. It's not the lack of finances, your bad health. It, it, none of that matters. You're to believe. God loves me. And whatever it is, my God, who loves me, can walk me through whatever it is. He will not fail me. He will not let me down. Don't try to figure out the outcome or how God's going to do it. It won't matter. God loves me. Now, He hates what we do wrong. But He still loves us. And the Bible says to go to heaven, you have to be perfect as righteous as God. And there's the problem. See, heaven is perfect, God is perfect, but we're not. We're all sinners. We have all come short of God's perfection. So we're all in the same boat. There is no difference. But God loves me. This hand represents Jesus Christ. He's the Lord. God in the flesh. He came into the world because God loves me. And he sent his son who had no sin. He didn't have to die. But he did die. Because God loves me. Now he hates my sin, but he loves me. So he took my sins and paid for them on the cross. And came back from the dead. 
And he says that if I, if I would believe that he did it for me, he would give me as a free gift everlasting life because he loves me. And when I believe that he did it for me, he says you can know that you have eternal life and know that you're going to heaven when you die. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. All because God loves me. That's 50 years ago when I heard this for the first time. And I've known for 50 years since. He still loves me. He still does. His love has not Change one iota. No shadow of turning. The gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God has never changed his mind. When he gave me this free gift of eternal life, he doesn't change his mind. He's not taking it back. He made a payment for my sins once and for all, and I'm going to heaven on what Jesus Christ did for me. That's a good story. But a lot of people have never heard, never understood. Let's pray, shall we? Every head bowed and every eye closed and no one looking around. If you're here this morning, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, I urge you to do that. I want you to believe that more than anything else in the world, God loves you. He sent His Son to die for you. Will you believe it? Will you accept Jesus Christ as your only hope of going to heaven? God said if you'd trust Him, He'd save you. I mean, save you from hell, give you eternal life, and you get to go to heaven on what he did for you. So with his bowed nice clothes, no one looking around, I'm not going to have you forward. I'm not going to embarrass you. But I'd like to know if what I said made sense to you. You said, preacher, that made sense to me this morning. I want to be certain of going to heaven when I die. And, and I want you to pray for me. I will accept Jesus Christ right now as my Savior. And, and friend, would you just slip your hand up very quickly and put it right back down. I'm not going to have you forward, but just to pray for you right where you are. Anyone at all say, yes, I'll trust Christ as my Savior. Pray for me. Anyone at all before we close? Anyone at all? If you're here this morning and you have trusted Christ as your Savior, has God been able to manifest His love through you? What have people said or done to you that's made you hurt? Maybe a little bitter? Discourage you? Love them anyway. Forgive them. They're just people with sinful natures. We all fail. Love covers a multitude of sins. Love your husband and wives, your children, grandkids. Our Father, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us. We pray, Lord, your will to be done in the lives of each person here.